Thank you, Richard. We have reading and learning from 1 John chapter 2. If you open your Bibles, 1 John chapter 2, we'll start reading at verse 28. And uh, get that up on the screen. First John chapter 2, and we'll start reading at 28, and we're going down to chapter 3, verse 3. It's only five verses. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, we may be confident and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Today I'll be using the New King James Version. I think this portion of scripture is better known to most of us here in this format, if not the original King James, but I'm using the New King James. And I do have a lot of Bible references, so I'll be putting them on the screen and uh, they'll all be in the New King James Version. Um, John in his epistle, when he started writing, he set out a purpose for writing that, uh, this epistle. And in chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, we read this. He says, We proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. His main concern is that they have, we have fellowship with him, fellowship with God, and fellowship with Jesus Christ. And the first two chapters are all about fellowship. And the last three chapters are about the sonship or our, yeah, as, as, as sons of God. And so these three, uh, five verses sort of link between the two, going from fellowship to the sonship of God. And uh, so we We'll go on with the, uh, the scriptures there. The first verse says, now little children. That little children, um, I looked it up in Strong's Concordance says that um, it's infants. It's uh, young converts. He's writing to new converts, young, young Christians. So he's teaching them, he said, we want you to abide in God's word. We want you to understand where you're coming from, to, to stay with the scriptures that you've learned and not to be sidetracked. So he addressed them as little children. And he does that in several verses in second chapter, in verse 12, 13, 18, and now in verse 28. So you can read them as you go through. The opening verse says, abide in him. It says, the opening verse says, abide in him. We need to go back to verse 24 to get the connection. Because 1 John chapter 2 verse 24 says this, Therefore let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. John is encouraging his readers and his listeners to abide in the word of God. The word of God which they heard at their conversion. He says in verse 26 that there will be some who will try to lead you astray, to seduce you. There will be false teachers. So why should we be aware of false teachers? Some, some Christians who uh, would try to lead other Christians astray. Why? Because they're not abiding in the spirit. 
The word abide occurs several times in the uh, first in first John. And just a couple, I haven't put on the screen, but the, um, you'll probably know them anyway. 1 John 2, 19 says, false teachers, will they do not abide or continue in the fellowship. They disrupt the fellowship. The word or the message we have heard, we have heard should abide in us. 1 John 2, 24, just read that. The anointing of the Holy Spirit abides in us and we should abide in the Spirit. And as we abide in the Word and the Spirit, we also abide in Christ, which is in our reading, verse 28. Verse 24, John is stressing that if we remain faithful to the Word of God, we will remain in the Son and in the Father. John is stressing the importance of knowing God's Word and obeying it. We can't know God's word by, re word by reading and studying it. Well, we can know God's word by reading and studying it in our personal quiet time each day. Just turning up on Sunday morning and thinking you're going to get to know that God's word is not enough. We need to study it every day, to read it and have a quiet time with him, to remain or to abide in God's word. Now, the word abide means to stay to continue, to endure, to remain. But it can also have the idea of perseverance in continuing. This gives us the idea that to abide or remain takes some effort and we have to work at it. It's not easy. We have to work at abiding. We, we have to make a, a definite attempt to live for God. John also gives us a good reason for doing this so that when he, as Jesus, appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. When Jesus comes again, and that's not an if, it's when Jesus comes again. It's a definite event. It's coming very soon. He says we can appear before him confident that we are faithful, have been faithful, and God will accept us because of what Jesus has done for us on that cross. We will not be ashamed when we come before him because we have done what he has commanded us to do. Some Christians will be ashamed. They will be ashamed that when, he, when they appear in his presence. As believers, we're all accepted, but there's a difference between accepted and being acceptable. A disobedient child who goes out and gets dirty will be accepted when he comes home, but he will not be treated as though he were acceptable. A Christian who has not walked in fellowship with Christ in obedience, love and truth will lose his rewards, and this will make him ashamed. He will be accepted, but not acceptable. There is no better statement from God than well done, good and faithful servant. And that should always be our goal, to be accepted in God's presence. Jesus is perfect man. He is righteous. Our, every, our very best works are as filthy rags. But when we appear before him, we take on his righteousness because he paid the penalty for our sins. If we're born again, we will want to live the life like to live life like Jesus. Not to obey an order as an order, but to obey him out of love. Jesus' coming is very imminent. It could be at any time. And as Steph said last week, we are not in the last days. We're in the last minutes. Jesus is coming again. John has written about light and darkness, love and hatred, truth and error. And in 1 John 2.29, he sums up the whole manner of Christian living in one phrase, doing righteousness. And that's the connection between the two portions that uh, we're talking about. Verse 29 is a test for whether someone is born of God. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness 
is born of him. When we are born again, we will practice righteousness in our living. We will want to practice righteousness. May we pass that test today. That is a test to see where we stand. As we abide in Christ, we will display God's righteousness. Our righteous acts are not perfect, but we will be perfected when we are united with Christ. And again, in uh, Philippians 2, 14, 16, um, do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or laboured in vain. And again, in 1 Peter 3 to 5, oops, I think I should, have, should be back there still. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. All our righteous acts are a sign that God, by his matchless love, has adopted us as his sons. It does not save us. Our right to sex do not save us. They're just a sign that God loves us. But it's proof that we are saved by his grace. Then we get that famous statement in verse 1 of chapter 3. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. It could be just translated, behold what love. And we have to repeat that. What love indeed. What love and how great is God's love for us. Well, we don't have to look very far. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In Romans 5 and 8, I'll read verses 6 from 6 to get the connection. For when we were still with the, our strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And in Ephesians 2, we read, and 2 and 4 we read, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love for, with which he loved us, and continuing down, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. But in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So if God so loved the world, God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us and because of his great love, which he has loved us. God's love for us is unique. Warren Worsby puts uh, 1 John 3, 1 this way. He says, behold, what peculiar out of this world kind of love the father has bestowed on us. He says, while we were his enemies, God loved us and sent his son to die for us. The whole wonderful plan of salvation begins with the love of God. And many translators add a little phrase in uh, 1 John 3 and 1. They say that we should be called the sons of God. And then they add, and we are. We are sons of God. It's not simply a high sounding name that we hear. It is reality we are god's children we do not expect the world to understand this thrilling relationship 
because it does not even understand God. Only a person who knows God through Christ can fully appreciate what it means to be called a child of God. Now, being a child of God is not something new in the New Testament. If we go back to the Old Testament, we have Israel was in a covenant relationship with God. Exodus 4.22 says this, Then say to Pharaoh, The Lord says, Israel is like an eldest son to me. The older son had, a special, had special privileges, especially in terms of his inheritance. The older son received a double portion. It also carried the weight of the spiritual guideline, guidelines for the family. It was a prized possession and something to be treasured. And uh, that's why Esau was condemned because he sold his birthright for a pot of stew. God said that Israel is likened to his oldest son. And again, in Deuteronomy chapter 14, we read, You are the children of the Lord your God. You shall not cut yourself nor shave the front of your head for the dead. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. And the Lord has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. So in the Old Testament, we have Israel as the sons of God or the children of God. So when we come to the New Testament, it changes. We get a new, new slant on things. Um, John in his uh, gospel in uh, chapter 1, verses 12 and 13 says this, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who are born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. So with the coming of Jesus, we have a closer relationship. When we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are the children of God. And again, in Romans chapter 8, we read, and as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to, to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And as children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. I can't think of a closer relationship than a father and the son. But all sons have a remarkable resemblance to their father. And we shall resemble the heavenly father because we shall be like Christ, who is the express image of the father. Jesus is the son of God. We read in Luke 1.35 that when the angels announced at his conception and the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. So at his con conception, he was announced as the Son of God. When he started his ministry in uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, we read, And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So at, at the start of his ministry, God says, This is my beloved son. And at the end of his ministry, the day before he's about to be crucified, God said, announces it again on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17 and 5. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Jesus is the son of God. We will be like God because we will be like Jesus. We'll be with him. And as, dear, as God's children, when Jesus is the son of God, we have this unique relationship with God and with Jesus. But having that re unique relationship 
means that we are aliens in this world. This is not our home. We're just a passing through. Philippians 3.20 says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly await for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be transformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able to subdue all things to himself. This world is not our home. We're just passing through. When our citizenship is in heaven, we have a completely new focus on life. We are told to lay up treasure in heaven. Because don't hold tight onto the things that belong to this world because they're all going to go. They're all fading away. They're going to perish. We can't take them with us. So I'm making an assumption today that I'm talking to those who are led by the Spirit of God, who believe on Jesus Christ. And if you do not believe, today's the day to make it right. Pray to him. Thank him for dying for you, for loving you. While you were still a sinner, he loved you and died for you. You can do it right now. Where you're seated, here or at home, wherever it might be, and so the rest of my message is really aimed at Christians. I want to encourage the believers. Because in uh, 1 John 3 and 1, we're told uh, what we are. And what we are in Christ, we are God's children. And verse 2 says, what we shall be, we shall be like him. The reference here, of course, is the time of Christ's coming for his church. And Stefan covered this very well last week. It's mentioned in 1 John 2.28 as an incentive for holy living. And now he repeats it. God's love for us does not stop with the new birth. It continues throughout our whole life and takes us right up to the return of Christ Jesus. When our Lord appears, all true believers will see him and will become like him. God's love is eternal. And in Philippians 3.20, we read, for our citizenship is in heaven, I've already read that, from which we also eagerly await. And we go down. This means, of course, that we will have new glorified bodies suited for heaven. This body with its sinful nature will vanish. This body which suffers pain Will be done away with this body which wants its own way will be in subjection to christ I have to say hallelujah amen in romans 8 and 29 we read for whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many believers moreover whom he predestined these he also called whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. So we are in conform to the image of his son. And if we're conformed to the image of his son, then our lives will be transformed. 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So as we are like Christ, we will be like him. We will want to be like him, to follow his example. But the apostle does not stop there. He has told us that we are what we are and what we shall be. Now in verse 3, he tells us, what we should be, and that is glorified, purified himself just as he is pure. In view of the return of Jesus Christ, we should keep our lives clean. No matter in which direction we look, we find reason to obey. If we look backwards, we see Calvary, we see Christ dying on the cross for us. If we look within, 
We see the Holy Spirit who lives within us and teaches us the truth. If we look around, we see fellow believers, Christians, whom we should be loving. But we also see a lost world that we should be reaching. And if we look ahead, we see Christ coming again. He's coming for us. Whichever way we look, we see Christ and his love for us. We are to abide in Christ and let our righteous acts prove that relationship. Our righteous acts are not perfect, but we will be perfected when we are united with Christ. One day we will be like him. Philippians 2.14 says this, do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or laboured in vain. All of this reminds us of the Father's love. Because the Father loved us and sent his son to die for us, we are children of God. Because God loves us, he wants us to live with him one day. Salvation from the start to the finish is an expression of the love of God. We are saved by the grace of God. But the provision for our salvation was founded in the love of God. Since we have experienced the love of Christ, we should have no desire to live in sin. Two Corinthians seven one says, "Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God." And Titus 2, 11 to 14 says this, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. What a statement. That we should live soberly, righteously and godly in this present age. An unbeliever who sins is a creature sinning against his creator. A Christian who sins is a child sinning against his father. The unbelieving, unbeliever sins against the law. The believer sins against love. But finally, there will be rewards at Christ's return. John 14, 3 says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. One of the rewards? Jesus is going to prepare a place for us. Philippians 3.20 For our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly await for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform your lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body. We get a new body. How great will that be? We get a new body. Colossians 3.4 When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. We get to be with Christ. We get to be with him in glory. I couldn't think of any better prize. 1 Peter 5, 4 says, And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. We get a crown. And we get that to lay at his feet. We get a crown. There are rewards. The life that is real is doing and not simply talking about it. Be hearers of the word and not uh, be doers of the word, not just hearers only. The real life does not give mental assent 
that a doctrine is true. Christians do not simply believe the truth, they do it. And that's what we need to remember. We don't just believe something, we do it. We put it into action. We're not just hearers of the word, we're doers of God's word. The person who professes to be a Christian, but who does not live in obedience, love and truth, is either deceived or a deceiver. That's important to remember that if we're not doing, we're either, we're either deceived in ourselves or we are deceiving others. A child bears the nature of his father and a person who has been born of God will reveal the characteristics of the heavenly father. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, Ephesians 5 and 1. So let us abide in God's love. Let us abide in God's word. Let us abide in Christ. A group of teenagers were enjoying a party and someone suggested that uh, they go to a certain nightclub for a good time. I'd rather you took me home, Jan said to her date. My parents don't approve of that place. <laughs> Afraid your father will hurt you? One of the girls asked sarcastically. No, Jan replied. I'm not afraid my father will hurt me, but I am afraid I might hurt him. She understood the principle that a true child of God who has experienced the love of God has no desire to sin against that love. So let us abide in him. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the encouragement we get from your word. Lord, help us to abide in Christ. Help us to abide in your word. Help us to allow the Holy Spirit to live and work in us. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.